We are in a defining moment for digital humanities. Due to several factors, including new technologies, the ease in which everyday historians can learn the latest communication techniques, and the desire to learn in a more open and transparent way, the history field is witnessing a new era in growth and possibilities. This is one such project which has garnered praise and allowed those who are curious about the past to engage with primary sources from an era of turmoil and dramatic change. Mississippi was one of the most powerful states in the Union when it seceded and joined the Confederacy. Over the next 16 years, devastating military campaigns, revolutionary emancipation, long-term army occupation, and groundbreaking legislation redefined the state and the nation. All of this can be studied in this rich collection. This is the Civil War and Reconstruction Governors of Mississippi Project. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this evening's live stream presentation here on the Tattoo Historian's Facebook and YouTube channels. My name is John. I am the Tattoo Historian, and I'm once again joined by my friends from the great state of Mississippi. First off, Dr. Susanna Yorl is back in the house. Uh, she's a professor of history and co-director of the Dale Center for the Study of War and Society at the University of Southern Mississippi. She's the author of numerous books, articles, editorials, uh, blog posts, columns, and digital history projects that share cutting edge historical ideas and research with scholars, educators, and the public. Second, we have Dr. Stephanie Seal Walters, my good buddy. She's the USM Digital Liaison in the Humanities. She earned her PhD from George Mason and focused her studies on loyalism in Virginia during the American Revolution. Uh, she's been a leader in the classroom when it comes to digital humanities, and a big shout out to her pug, Bunker, as well. <laughs> I, I miss him. Uh, <laughs> our special guest tonight is Dr. Max Grivno. Uh, Max joined the history faculty of the University of Southern Mississippi in 2007 after completing his doctorate at the University of Maryland. Uh, Dr. Grivno's first book is entitled Gleanings of Freedom, Free Labor and Slavery Along the Mason-Dixon Line, 1790 to 1860, which was published in 2011 as part of the University of Illinois Press's series, The Working Class in American History. Uh, Max is currently writing From Bondage to Freedom, Slavery in Mississippi, 1690 to 1865. His teaching interests include the Old South, slavery, labor history, and Mississippi history. And tonight we're going to be discussing a very interesting time in Mississippi history and American history, and that is the era of emancipation. Uh, Susanna, this one is going to be interesting because emancipation isn't a cut and dry subject. Yeah, I mean, thanks, John, and, and for that great intro of all of us. And, you know, I know all of us thank Max for joining us tonight. Mm -hmm. I, Max and I have been on a lot of committees together in our time in the history program at USM. And I just don't think anybody understands slavery in Mississippi, Mississippi during this time period better, better than he does. So Max, I appreciate you joining us tonight. Thank you. My, yeah, my favorite thing about the documents that we've uncovered so far, um, and if, if we have new listeners out there, remember the idea here is that we're digitizing, transcribing, and annotating the state's governor's papers from right before the Civil War all the way in through Reconstruction and into the New South, because everybody, just about everybody, seemed to write to the governor with their complaints. And so it's a great way to hear from people that you don't traditionally hear from. And when it comes to the process of emancipation, the documents we've been finding so far really helped to underscore the fact that it is indeed a process. Um, and it's not a steady process. It's not a steady progression to freedom. You know, there's movements backwards and forwards. And so, you know, when, when, when listeners go to the sample document site and they kind of click on emancipation and citizenship, that theme, they can see these records that we've been uncovering that look at it, the fact that it's, you know, it's so often portrayed as this, this kind of jubilee moment when in fact it's, it's, it's a very nervous moment. Um, where people really aren't quite sure what's going to result from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, it's all, it, Max. It's almost like uh, you know we we tend to uh, we as in laymen or or people who just have a slight interest in this era uh, tend to think of 
uh, Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation in late 1862. It takes effect January 1. And everything changes and it's a whole new era exactly right away uh, for everywhere, including the states in rebellion. And uh, it's not that, not that way at all, is it, Max? No. Uh, in many ways, the Emancipation Proclamation was the culmination of well, generations of struggle on the part of the enslaved, but also of a uh, of a very halting, uh, hesitating movement on the part of the federal government to embrace emancipation mm -hmm. as as a war aim. Uh, there were early blows against slavery. I mean, I th I think if you want to understand how emancipation unfolded in Mississippi, you almost need to, to step back for a moment to see how federal policy was evolving. Um, you know, in July of 1861, just a few months after the war began, uh, John C. Fremont uh, attempted to free the enslaved people of Missouri, uh, declaring the state in open rebellion. Uh, Lincoln very quickly uh, pushed back against that and had the wonderful line that any effort to strike at slavery in Missouri may well undo their fair hopes of, of maintaining uh, Kentucky. Uh, but all through that summer of 1861, you start to see these very small steps uh, unfolding on a national scale that would soon have a, have a profound effect on Mississippi. Uh, in the summer of 1861, August of 1861, you see the first step toward emancipation uh, with the first Confiscation Act. And the first Confiscation Act declared that slaves employed by the Confederacy could be confiscated by the federal military. So enslaved people who had worked on Confederate fortifications, who had been attached to the Confederate Army as Teamsters or cooks, they could be confiscated. Uh, but they were not freed. Uh, the government nullified their owner's uh, claim to them, but they were reluctant to claim that they were that they were free. Uh, and they were also very um, adamant that enslaved people who belonged to loyal masters uh, would not be would not be affected by this act. Uh, by February of 1862, as the war starts to close in on, on Mississippi, you still see the government very slow to act. Uh, when Union forces under General Halleck began moving through Tennessee, uh, Halleck declared that the state of, or the condition of was something best left to the courts, uh, that his men were not going to welcome uh, enslaved people into their lines. They were not going to employ them as laborers. And General Grant, as he was making his way through Tennessee, uh, enforced that policy. Uh, this starts to change a bit as you move into the spring and summer of 62. Uh, in March of 1862, uh, President Lincoln amended the um, Articles of War to declare that federal soldiers no longer had to return uh, fugitive slaves that they were not going to be slave catchers for disloyal masters. Um, and then in July of 1862, you get the second Confiscation Act, which freed um, fugitive slaves who came into Union lines and who could be employed by the Union Army. Um, and it also encompassed their families. And that was uh, passed at the same time that the Militia Act was passed which said that those uh, fugitive slaves uh, who came into Union lines could actually be put to use in military service. Now, they were very vague at this point. Uh, the language is any service to which they may be found competent. Uh, it, does that mean military laborer? Does that mean, does that mean soldier? Uh, right. In many ways, they're, they're still... Uh, they're still testing the waters to see what's politically possible. Uh, but you see this start to unfold uh, on a federal level in the spring and summer of 62. And then in Mississippi, you see the effects of that, right? Uh, whereas in early 62, uh, Halleck did not want to interfere with slavery. Uh, by the time Union forces uh, occupy Corinth, for example, um, by the time they occupy Corinth, they're welcoming uh, fugitives into federal lines. They're using them as military laborers. Uh, General Hovey was doing something very similar in Memphis. 
uh, where enslaved people from across the Yazoo Delta in Mississippi and Arkansas were fleeing into the city. He very quickly put them uh, to use as military laborers. And, and so you start to see by the time you get into the summer of 1862, uh, even before the preliminary Emanci Emancipation Proclamation, um, the destruction of slavery is fast becoming a war aim. Mm. But, but again, this it's very much, um, it, it's a policy that unfolds very, very gradually in fits and starts. Uh, sometimes it's pushed uh, by aggressive commanders on the ground, um, commanders who might have uh, abolitionist sentiments or at least people who despise the slaveocracy. Uh, in other cases, you see generals who were reluctant to strike a blow against slavery. Uh, when uh, General Butler took command of New Orleans, he believed that he could win over um, many old Whig planters who might have been loyalists to the Union cause if he if he tried to maintain control of, of the plantations, uh, if he didn't mm. interfere with slavery. Uh, mm. and, and he backed away from that policy fairly quickly. But it's um, improvisational, I think, might be one of the best words to describe what's happening on the ground that's, that's classic military doctrine is like improvisational after a while and then keep keep it open-ended with the language of the of the orders of what can we do what can't we do uh you know to, to try to be like well we we read it this way so we're going to allow this to happen and all that so you don't get in that political quagmire in dc or or anything like that um steph with with the citizens of Mississippi witnessing this gradual movement in this direction. Are any of uh, these people writing to the governor and saying, uh, you know, I'm seeing the writing on the wall basically of what's happening here, I'm not appreciating this uh, or maybe in favor of it. Uh, what, what do we see with some of these primary sources that, that are in this digital project? Um, a lot of what we see, I think, unsurprisingly, is a lot of resentment. Um, just because, you know, this that's a theme that we really see um, throughout the collection, especially leading up to 1865, you know, when um, Mississippi officially surrenders. Um, however, what you see more than anything, which I was kind of surprised about, is in 1865, starting around May, um, you see um, citizens writing Governor Sharkey, um, and they're concerned and confused about how emancipation is exactly going to happen. Um, there's a gentleman named George T. Swan. Um, he is from Jackson. Um, and the eight, we have his 1850s um, census and slave schedule. He owns about 16 individuals in 1850, 1860. He owns six enslaved people. Um, and so anyway, he's asking not only, you know, if they have to follow through with emancipation, but how exactly is it going to happen? Um, is it overnight? All of a sudden his enslaved individuals are free. Is there going to be a gradual process? of emancipation. And you really see this theme of different individuals who own enslaved people um, who are asking, wait a second, okay, so we understand emancipation is going to happen and is happening, but could you give us better instructions of how this is supposed to follow through or go through? Um, you see that echoed through a letter from S.R. Frierson from Columbus. Um, and we also have a Methodist minister named Alex J. Smith from Neshoba County, who's also very confused as what's about to happen in Mississippi be in 1865. Mm. Yeah. And John, I think one of the interesting kind of undercurrents in all of those letters is it's, it's this like, so there's going to be no compensation. Yeah. And you know, it's this question of, wait, how much power exactly am I losing? Um, and who is going to have the power if I don't, you know, there's this, there's almost this they understand that the world's their world is turned upside down, but they're not. They're almost. It's almost like they're still trying to negotiate for something. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And I don't know. I could be reading that wrong, Max. But that's certainly how I've been reading those those letters, as though they're saying, "Look, I, I'm a, I'm a loyal U.S. citizen now," which is an interesting comment in some way. <laughs> like this very quick. No, 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 no. I'm I'm, yeah. I'm I'm back. I'm loyal now. Right. But it's I feel like they're negotiating, you know, and Max, I'd love to hear your take on it from from your own research is if, if that's what you're hearing or how common this is. So this is this is where I think geography uh, comes into play. Um, during the war, uh, the Union military occupied Corinth. They occupied the environs around 
uh, Memphis and Vicksburg and Natchez. Uh, they had a fairly strong presence through the Mississippi River Valley. Uh, there were periodic occupations of Natchez. Uh, and then you had the Confederate government kind of on the run in the interior, moving from Jackson to Meridian to, to Columbus. And there's that corner of the state, uh, the, the southeast to south central corner of the state, I suppose, uh, that remained under a rather tenuous Confederate control where there were periodic Union raids, but not a permanent Union occupation. And there you see slavery gradually unraveling during the war. You also see this massive exodus of slaveholders uh, retreating from the Mississippi River Valley and from Corinth deeper into the Confederate interior. Some of them had made a dash for Texas uh, while that was a possibility, but it's almost the reverse of what you saw during the 1830s, during the flush times, where enslaved people had been pulled south and west. Now they're getting pushed, uh, they're getting pushed back to the east and, and to the north into areas that are perceived as, as safe. Uh, in areas around uh, Natchez and Vicksburg, where they see a strong federal presence, where uh, there are early experiments with free labor on abandoned plantations, and certainly where you have a strong USCT presence, I think you would have to be almost delusional uh, to imagine that slavery could somehow be resurrected. But some of these folks who had retreated into the interior with their enslaved people may have hoped to get something to get something back, and you know, there were lawsuits filed uh, after the war where you see slaveholders saying, "Well, I I bought a slave in 1864, but technically uh, slavery was uh, abolished at that point. So can I get my money back?" Uh, <laughs> things like that. Um, after the war, there's a whole movement um, to actually get some kind of compensation. You know, they actually organized politically to try to get some kind of of compensation. Um, but my sense is that um, although former slaveholders wanted desperately to hang on to as many vestiges of, of the institution as they could, right? And you certainly see that with the black codes, uh, where they're trying to push uh, freed men and women very close uh, or just something very uh, close to, to slavery. There, there is a recognition, I think, that the institution is, is dead. Uh, they're not going to embrace emancipation. They're certainly not going to push for full um, legal equality for the freedmen and women. Um, but my my sense is that in large parts of the state, they've recognized the institution is is shattered, um, mm -hmm. even if it's begrudging, right? And of course, there were also. I mean, there there's a there's a wonderful document that's often published, um, written by a a freedmen's bureau officer who is active around Vicksburg. Uh, who said something to the effect that uh, slaveholders were telling uh, freedmen and women that emancipation was simply a wartime policy, and that now that the war was over, uh, emancipation would be would be rolled back. But so this officer had to ride out to the plantation and disabuse him of that notion uh, fairly quickly. Um, but what I think you see is a kind of tactic after the war. Uh, to use uh, extra legal violence and then state power when they could wield it to try to narrowly circumscribe uh, what, what freedom would look like. Mm -hmm. It didn't, uh, it, it just, I know you haven't gone through all of the documents yet and, and that's why I've put out the call to people and I've placed the link in the chat about helping to get these documents all transcribed and, and such. So if you're in the chat, you can see that link there and help out. Have you uncovered any documents yet uh, which have pointed to the fact that maybe in the early days of emancipation or even in 1862 when parts of uh, the Mississippi are starting to be taken over by federal troops, uh, especially down towards New Orleans area and up further north, do you, do you see any letters yet to the governor saying, hey, these federal soldiers just took my, my enslaved peoples and I want them back? Or, or whatever else, or do you see it in the early part of the emancipation process, let's say 1863, uh, where the war's not over yet, it's still undecided, and there's this kind of back and forth and fighting amongst uh, the white uh, uh, slave owners in, the, in their, and 
in their plantation homes and all this stuff to the governor saying, Hey, there's no policy. And they just took, you know, my property. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a few cool cases that have come up already. Um, a couple of them you would expect, right. Where there's the telegram that's in the sample documents from Jefferson Davis, basically talking about kind of the dangerous level a number of um, enslaved men who are escaping to the federal lines and, and joining the federal army. And, you know, what are we going to do about this? Or basically, what are you going to do about this in Mississippi? Um, there's a, there's a fascinating, probably my favorite document because I don't quite know what to do with it. And those are, those are always the fun ones. Those are always the mysteries. You know, there, there are some that are like, look, we need to organize a home guard and I'm offering my services. And, you know, that's the Isaac Applewhite, document that's in the sample docs from 1862. But my favorite one is from the fall of 1863 in Bolivar County, where it's a report about a man by the name of Milford Coe, who's being accused of basically doing what might remind the public of a free state of Jones type operation or activity where he's, you know, this, he looks like he's a former overseer, but he's, he's organizing enslaved peoples to run away they're basically kind of kind of hiding all kind of together and then conducting raids on wealthy planters homes and kind of other properties in the region. And, and you know, the Confederate forces are trying to decide what to do about this. And I'm wondering, and, and Steph has been digging and digging and digging, trying to find out more about Co, trying to find out more about these activities. And, you know, what I'm wondering is if, you know, this is a, a reminder that, you know, the free state of Jones was not a unique example of, of dissent, that there's, you know, just like in any ward, you know, there, there's dissent all over the state. Um, but I don't know that you see it kind of in this organized level, um, and nor is it as common, you know, dissent doesn't always mean it's going to be an organized dissent involving whites and blacks. And that's what stands out to me as a little bit different about it. But again, that was one of those stories I was hoping you could weigh in on, Max, because I'm, I'm not sure quite what to make of Milford Cove. Right. The, there, um, without speaking to Cove directly, uh, but uh, looking at other examples of organized, uh, organized resistance, um, it, to my mind, it's the organized resistance of the enslaved, right? Stephen Hahn uh, famously referred to the, the Civil War as the largest slave insurrection in American history, just the one that we've all, that we've all missed. Um, there is a, a wonderful uh, autobiography written by a Union officer who was taken prisoner in North Mississippi and who was then taken down to Meridian uh, and held in prison there uh, in, until he had the opportunity to escape, who describes his kind of hapless effort to get back to the Union lines, which he knew must be somewhere to, to the north. So he began advancing along the Mobile and Ohio Railroad. Uh, at some point he lost his bearings and he wound up in Alabama somehow or another. Uh, and then he was taken in by the enslaved. Um, and they ferried him from house to house. And he describes them as having a series of call signs of, or excuse me, of signs and counter signs, hand grips, uh, kind of secret messages carved into the sides of trees that they had this entire network of resistance uh, designed to move Union soldiers, but also to move news about the war uh, among, the, among the enslaved. Uh, and this fellow eventually escaped from house to house to house. Uh, it was very clear to him that this was organized until he finally got back to, to Memphis. Um, there was another example, which I absolutely love. It was an Iowa soldier also campaigning uh, in, in North Mississippi who uh, recalled that he heard about developments in federal policy toward the enslaved from the enslaved. Uh, as he was tramping through North Mississippi, he heard about the Militia Act and all of its details from the enslaved. And he heard about the Emancipation Proclamation from the, from the enslaved. That the, it was clear that there was, that news was moving around very, very quickly um, uh, among the enslaved. And, um, you know, th there's another example. This one is from around Starkville, where a, 
a Freedmen's Bureau officer visited an, ab visited an abandoned plantation and he found that the former slaves had effectively taken control of the plantation. They had confiscated it and they said they would only take orders from President Lincoln himself. That this was essentially a, a kind of autonomous uh, collective they they created, and I, I think with all these examples speak to is first of all the fact that the enslaved uh, were well versed about what was happening. Uh, they were mobilized on the ground, uh, but they also speak to something else, which I think a really important part of the story, uh, which is that in much of Mississippi, what you see during the war isn't just the collapse of slavery, but it's the kind of breakdown of, of civilian government yeah. across the state. Mm -hmm. That basic law and order starts to come undone and it creates a kind of vacuum. The union forces could impose discipline and order uh, in areas they chose to occupy. Uh, the Confederate government could do the same depending upon where it was at any given time. Um, but lots of the state are simply a kind of no man's land by 62, 63, oh, certainly by the time you get to 64 with, Meridi with uh, Sherman's Meridian campaign, there's just a lot of lawlessness in, in the state. You know, the, the largest, I think, Confederate garrison would have been Mobile, and they're periodically launching raids up into southeast Mississippi. Um, there are Confederate forces in central Alabama. Um, but, you know, again, those forces, they're thin on the ground and they're not really interested in trying to occupy or impose any kind of order on, on Mississippi. So I, I suspect as people look more and more, they're going to find cases like the case of Coe, uh, these people who are essentially creating their own kind of community in the midst of this, of this vacuum. Mm -hmm. yeah. John, John, can I jump in with one more question? Absolutely. <laughs> I know you're supposed to be leading, but I'm like, I have all sorts of questions. This is, this is a conversation. It can go any direction. <laughs> That's why we love Facebook Live. <laughs> well, what I'm wondering, based on what you just described, Max, is if it's a possibility that Co is being potentially given too much credit, that some of the, the white authorities in the area can't imagine that the enslaved could be organizing and hand, do, were doing these raids themselves, and they're crediting Co, and maybe even others like potentially Knight maybe has been given too much credit. Um, is is right. that a possibility we should explore? I mean, I think that's certainly a possibility. If you go all the way back to the Madison County insurrection scare in the 1830s, uh, there's always this suspicion that any, re any rebellion among the enslaved has to have a white man at the heart of it. And if, if you look at the insurrection scares that gripped Mississippi uh, in the years immediately following the John Brown raid, quite mm -hmm. often their um, white men were arrested uh, and in some cases imprisoned or beaten or even lynched because the assumption was that there had to be a some kind of white firebrand behind this. Uh, if you look at the Second Creek insurrection in Natchez, they were always looking for white men. There were a series of um, I don't even know if they were rebellions, let's just call them scares in North Mississippi, where they arrested white railroad workers, traveling, uh, traveling merchants or physicians, um, any white man who was, who was out of place, uh, was subject to being, uh, arrested if there was an insurrection scare. So Co could have just been the, the one white man they, they signaled out. But you know, I also think it's worth pointing out that the Delta, you know, during the war really does descend into complete chaos. Uh, there's a, uh, I don't know how to describe it, but something happened on Deer Creek, uh, in which a group of armed, uh, black men, possibly operating in concert with uh, black soldiers or black recruits, uh, attacked, murdered, and possibly raped um, white families in that neighborhood. Um, there was a group of uh, Texas cavalrymen operating in the Delta who were preying upon uh, freed men and women, uh, attacking contraband camps, that kind of thing. Uh, the, the stories that seep out of the Delta um, they're often incomplete, they're often fragmentary, right? They're reports that are drifting into Vicksburg or Memphis, uh, but they are, they, they do suggest that something very bad is happening up in, up in the Delta. Uh, and that's probably because the area was sparsely settled before the Civil War. 
Uh, there's all kinds of evidence that the planters hold on the enslaved in the Delta was already tenuous when the war began. Uh, the state passed a series of laws in the 1850s ratcheting up the uh, rewards given for runaway slaves, right? Which suggests that there's a problem there even before the war begins. But yeah, the, 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 what's happening in the Delta is, um, it's one of the stories that is seldom told of, of Civil War Mississippi, um, but it, it, it is, um, it, it does complicate this kind of Jubilee story. I mean, there, there are hints of, of vengeance and retaliation of, um, of atrocities being committed uh, by Union and by Confederate soldiers. It's, it's a very ugly war. One of the things that I wanted to mention too, um, looking at the Milford Co. letter, it's actually authored by a captain in Herndon's Rangers, if I'm not mistaken. Um, his name is W.E. Montgomery, and he's from Bolivar County, and he actually has a large plantation in that area. Um, we've seen in CWRGM quite a few times where plantation owners are writing to the governor because they're upset um, of you know African American insurrection happening. There is something particularly urgent about Montgomery's letter about Milford Co. And just taking a step back, talking about um, since he is a white individual who is helping um, African Americans, you know, destroy property in the area and cause problems. Um, this is kind of the first time that I've looked through the collection and seen, you know, a specific reference to a white individual, specifically an overseer um, who is helping these people or is helping African Americans like destroy property and kind of cause mayhem. And you can tell that he is mostly concerned that Milford Co. is the person who is helping him. Whereas normally with other letters that we've seen in CWRGM, it's like, oh man, we're having issues again. Um, Montgomery is a lot more urgent and a lot more serious that something needs to happen to stop Co. so nothing else happens. It's a good is point, that, Steph. Yeah. 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 All this really showcases to a lot of us just how, you know, uncivil this war really was we we want we want to make it like blue gray and every white male in mississippi thought this way and every white male in pennsylvania thought this way there's these pockets of resistance going on throughout the confederacy uh you know it, it's it's almost like we hear about the free state of jones and and maybe we should really give like a two minute synopsis of what that is but if you take that um idea of what that is and 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 what it became at the time, the symbol that it became, it seems like these pockets are all over the place and they're not one offs. It's just free state of Jones got Matthew McConaughey to play the leader of it. And now we all know about that. Uh, <laughs> so, so it's in popular culture now, but um, do you want to give a, does anyone want to give like a two minute synopsis of what the free state of Jones is? And then we can, as an audience, we can take that and think, okay, there's a half dozen of these or there's, or however many, we don't know the exact number yet because we haven't gone through all the documents it's just in Mississippi. And who knows if there was something in Alabama, Louisiana, what was the free state of Jones? What was the idea behind it? What was the symbol of the free state of Jones? Right. Well, the free state of Jones is in many ways what I often refer to as this almost this rural resistance to the Confederacy. And, and, and Max, your earlier comment about, you know, keep in mind geography, um, and we would also, you know, include class in that, is the reminder that just everywhere where you see resistance and dissent does not necessarily mean it's, it's the same form or that it's inspired by the same motives. I would argue that, you know, the free state of Jones, where you're seeing this kind of dissent and this resistance against conscription, and the frustrations about, um, you know, it gets it gets spun into um, a bit of um, kind of a, a resistance against the planter class, and you know, new new night kind of turning against um, enslavers and kind of siding with the enslaved. But I think the thing to realize about the Free State of Jones, and, and by the way, you guys, if, if people don't know the story, the the argument is that Jones County ends up seceding from the Confederacy, which it doesn't ever officially do. But it does, you know, you do have armed resistance and that it becomes more than just, you know, Confederates who are furloughed, who are refusing to go back to their units. I mean, you actually have armed resistance. But I, but the thing I always want people to remember is that, you know, but you can see dissent in different forms in different parts of the state. You can see wealthy planters demonstrating some unionism and dissent um, of their own 
but again, but, but in very different ways. And it depends on federal, which forces are in the area, which, ha, which has the kind of the stronger strength, if you will, in the region. Um, and I would argue that the, that the Free State of Jones story has also been kind of complicated by this story of kind of a mixed race relationship. Um, and it, there's, there's a whole host of elements there to get into. But the thing that I love to remind people about the Free State of Jones is that it's, it's not just Jones County. Um, and as we mentioned last week, you can see these monuments in, in places um, like where Max and I live in Forest County, celebrating this kind of unified Confederate defense of, of the, the region, when in fact, this was an incredibly divided um, region. And, and so that's one of the reasons I'm so curious about the code document is that it's gonna help us, I think, help others understand that this is this these are not just pockets um you know and then you, you could argue there's whole swaths right of appalachia um of, of sections of the confederacy where this again this is not unique to mississippi either and max i don't know if you want to add anything about the free, free state of jones you've done a ton on that with your students in your mississippi history classes right yeah, I'm not certain that I could give a two minute discussion of the Free State of Jones without talking myself in circles because uh, it, what what happened in Jones County, uh, my answer is probably going to vary on the day of the week and the time of the day. Um, there are so many different uh, different interpretations of what of what happened up there. Um, my best guess is um, it's probably a pocket of anti, uh, anti-Confederate uh, activity, um, which isn't to say that it's unionist or abolitionist, um, but that is probably a group of disgruntled, war-weary um, white men and their families, I think. And that, and that certainly became much more common as, as, as the war uh, went on. And it didn't even need to take the form of, of armed resistance. I mean, there were, uh, in areas like Corinth and around Memphis, um, Otherwise, loyal Confederates were moving through the lines every chance they could to trade with the Union. Uh, Slaveholders um, and planters were attempting to smuggle their cotton through the lines uh, to get it to, to the Union uh, where they could sell it for some kind of hard currency. Uh, you see all kinds of evidence of, of uh, breakdown. But you know, there, there was something that you had mentioned um, you know, about opposition of the Confederacy and this is something that shows up in uh, in many of the letters to the governor, which is resistance um, on the part of slaveholders uh, against Confederate policies, uh, especially the Confederate impressment of enslaved people to work on fortifications. Um, even at times, um, you know, as the Confederates were uh, trying to solidify their defenses around Vicksburg, they found it very difficult to recruit uh, enslaved people to work there because slaveholders simply did not want their bondsmen taken to Confederate uh, Confederate fortifications. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this whole this whole idea of uh, resistance and having a, a free state of Jones or or wherever it may be, this po these pockets goes back to the idea of <clears throat> who who you are as a citizen. What are you a citizen of? <clears throat> Excuse me. Are you a citizen of United States? Are you a citizen of the Confederacy? Are you a citizen of a county? Um, and regionalism starts to prop back up. But with the Emancipation Proclamation uh, coming out, which leads to, you know, the war aim that it, that it does help with the war effort in the long run, it leads to the 13th Amendment. You can almost draw a direct line to it in ways it's a very squiggly line really <laughs> it goes around <laughs> some corners and takes some twists and turns but at least this idea of citizenship and mm -hmm. and uh the 14th amendment and 15th amendment after that uh steph with with there was a document from i believe his name was gainey jj mm -hmm. gainey uh he's a union army vet and he's and he's wow. down uh the mississippi secret service hanging out down there in mississippi and finding out about to investigate the clan and, and their things because they're, they're going against this idea of, you know, citizenship and, and uh, who's going to be a citizen and what the rights are going to be for voting rights. How does the Emancipation Proclamation to, you know, that part towards Reconstruction, you know, 
what do we see from the people who are like we talked about earlier where it's post-war and you're like well what am i supposed to do am i going to get re am i get compensation what's going to happen the idea of citizenship pops up though too right is uh, as far as rights are concerned in some of these letters I mean, what are what are these rights going to be and how's it going to work that's actually one that i'm going to pawn off on susanna um because oh, okay. that one a little bit I'm better i'm trying than to rope you in steph no, yeah. <laughs> I'm enjoying the conversation so much. I'm like, Susanna, you next. <laughs> no, I mean, because, I mean, Steph's such a good sport. She's always doing the, like, she is my, like, freaking digital wizard for the for the project. And she does all the backstory research. But I think what people don't realize about Steph is she's actually a historian of the Revolutionary War era. Right. right? Really? And so we're like, yeah. Steph, we need you in yeah. the Civil yeah. War era. Just yeah. come forward about 100 years and just, just work with me. Right. Um, the, right. the, the Gainey right. document, and you know, I really encourage listeners to go check this one out. And and um, my, one of my PhD students, Lucas Summers, wrote a great piece on this that we're we're hoping mm -hmm. to at least release through the blog, if not elsewhere. Mm -hmm. But basically, what happens in 1870 is Governor Alcorn has launched this kind of investigation into the Klan, almost as a way to kind of tell the federal government that Mississippi is going to be able to handle this Klan problem on its own. Um, which it will quickly demonstrate that it really can't do and maybe doesn't necessarily want to do. Um, and the, what, what, what happens is it's, it's this, this investigation in Lafayette County of this individual who's gotten involved with the Klan. Ganey is basically gaining his confidence. And it's, it's almost like a wiretapping operation before you can do wiretapping. <laughs> Um, you know, Ganey's going to be placing some folks under a bridge so that they can hear the conversation he has with the young man who's involved with the Klan so that they can later testify that this is indeed what the man says. Um, he's uncovering some um, assaults, possibly some murders that take, took place in Arkansas. So it's, it's this it's this full on investigation. But what you're also seeing is locals figuring out what Ganey is, you know, quote unquote, up to. Um, and that this union veteran who they thought might be okay is probably not okay um, with, with the white population. And again, it's, it's gonna be this, this it's, it's, a, it's pulling a couple of threads for me. Um, one of which is this reminder of how many union veterans, um, white, excuse me, union veterans stay in the state after the war um, and are gonna remain there and, and it's, it's also this reminder of, by the way, there are also, you know, hundreds, thousands of black union veterans in the state. And, you know, do, are there kind of any contacts that remain between these individuals? Are, is there any power to being a union veteran in a state that increasingly is going to celebrate a, a Confederate memory? Um, and, and so there's, there's all sorts of these threads that you're going to be able to pull out of documents like the Ganey one, but it's, it's, it's this look to, I feel like it's this lens in 1870 as things are, your, your hopes for change in Mississippi are starting to unravel. And you're, you're really seeing that this is, this is, this is, this is not going in good, good places and in good directions. Yeah. yeah you can really see that too in the Joseph J Jackson document, the man who um, killed a formerly enslaved person on his mother's plantation. Um, just that it's not really going in a great direction. There is, let's see, I believe it's Joseph Jackson, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Joseph L. Jackson. Yeah. Um, on the 4th of July in 17, 17, that's how you know I'm an 18th century. <laughs> in 1865, um, he is a accused of shooting and murdering um, a worker on his mother's plantation. Um, and we know that he was formerly enslaved at that plantation. Um, and Joseph Jackson says that it was in self-defense, but you know, we, we can take that with all it's worth, um, that it was in self-defense. We don't know whether it was or whether it wasn't, um, but there are starting to be kind of acts of violence like this happening. I do think it's significant that um, it happened on July 4th in the Vicksburg area. He was actually a part of the Vicksburg campaign two years earlier and was imprisoned on July 4th. I don't know if the date has any significance, but we did find um, his prison record from that time. But two years to the day, um, he shoots an Afri African-American man on his mother's plantation for reasons we have no idea why. Um, so you can't, can't kind of can see some of the breakdown um, happening across the state. Yeah, and if you look at that document too, you're gonna notice that the Freedmen's Bureau gets involved and mm -hmm. they, they really wanna try and, and charge Jackson in a military court because they don't. They, it sounds like they're not trusting the civilian court um, to actually provide a fair trial for, for the murdered man. 
Um, and the, the document is basically this appeal on behalf of Jackson to get President Johnson involved to basically kind of force the Freedmen's Bureau to butt out. And that's what I'm talking about. Like you can see some power for, with the U.S. military. You can see some power with the Freedmen's Bureau helping, trying maybe to help protect Freedmen's rights. And then by this 1870 document with, with uh, involving Ganey and the Alcorn administration, it's as though you know there there's this investigation, but I'm not sure. I'm not confident in in the, this ability to really thwart the violence that you're starting to see in, increasing um, throughout the state. Mm. And that that whole uh, you know all those documents are going to be fascinating to see how that transpires, especially in the Reconstruction era for me, because I think that far too often it's overlooked uh, as far as why uh, things transpire post-war into the early 20th century. You kind of glaze over the Reconstruction era and say, well, it's a failed thing, so we're just going to move on and, and forget about it. When in fact, some of these documents are going to shed new light on that particular part of history, which is what's really interesting to me. Do we get former uh, enslaved persons writing to the governor in the 1880s, 1870s, I mean, and saying, this is what, you know, this is what I think of, you know, citizenship, or this is what I, what I believe I deserve for what I've gone through, for what my family's going through. And when you think there's 20,000 of these documents just sitting, waiting to be done with, like this and be, and, and be read and be transcribed, who knows what yeah. could be out there. And one document could be its own book you know, you never know what you're going to find. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think y'all have heard me talk before about the Lambert Moore letter that shows up, you know, with, with Governor Sharkey right after the Civil War, basically Moore saying he was already taxed on his labor as an enslaved man during the war when he was hiring himself out. You can't tax me on my wartime's earnings again. Um, but that 1865 document you know, juxtapose that to some of the ones we have for 18, 1875, 1876, where you're having um, sheriffs writing in basically saying, you know, there's, there's just open violence now against African-Americans, particularly during election season. Um, and, you know, the federal government has got you. The federal government has to do something or Governor Ames is going to have to do something. Um, and and nothing's nothing's happening. You're having the complete breakdown of, of this ability to fight against this. And Max, you might be able to put some of this in context too, in terms of how, how common these documents are that we're describing, or if you're just, if you're like, no, they're, that those are a little bit unusual. Um, so the records that I'm, I'm most familiar with are, are the records that were sent to the, um, the, the, the letters or complaints that made their way to the, to the Freedmen's Bureau. Um, and there you see that notions of uh, citizenship, uh, especially in the immediate post-war year, were often inextricably linked to economic concerns, mm -hmm. uh, more specifically uh, the right to contract uh, and trying to establish what the new terms of, of labor were, were going to be. Uh, they, they were essentially trying to create a, a free labor society in uh, a, a state where the vast majority of people were former uh, former bondsmen and women. Um, and the Freedmen's Bureau, it, it's one of the greatest misconceptions about the Freedmen's Bureau um, was that, it, <laughs> how to say this, um, it, its influence and power, I think, have been greatly exaggerated. Um, yeah. Bureau agents were yeah. often um, alone at a post. Uh, they were seldom at a post. Uh, very long. Uh, some of them were people simply looking to eke a little bit more time out of their commission. Some of them were people looking to find some way to take economic advantage of the uh, of the former slaves or looking to become planters uh, in their own right. Uh, they were they were opportunists. Yes, yes, there were some true believers in there who were trying to create uh, a free labor society. Um, but you know, the Bureau, um, when, when you look at the records of Bureau offices in Mississippi, one of the things that's striking is how e ephemeral they were. You know, an agent might only be in an office for a few months before mm -hmm. he was discharged or transferred. Offices were constantly being uh, relocated and merged. 
uh, Freedmen's Bureau officers did not really have any any authority. Um, in more remote parts of the state, there was very little that they could actually do. Uh, most of the union occupation forces um, in the state were infantry units and the Bureau was very clear that did very little good. What they needed was cavalry uh, in order to move quickly to these remote areas. Um, and even when they could flex military power, that military power was often in the hands of, of black men, which made them reluctant to to, to use it. Um, so th this again, I think is another layer of just this story of chaos that in the immediate post-war year, um, the Union Army, and then as time goes on, the, the Freedmen's Bureau was supposed to nursemaid or midwife this new society into being, but it really didn't have the wherewithal to do it. Uh, and so you see in the immediate post-war period, that summer and fall of 65, uh, the Black Codes went into effect. Um, after that, you do see movement, but it's it's largely on the part of the federal government, right? It, the, the, re, the Reconstruction regime in Mississippi was often entirely dependent on federal force uh, in order to withstand attacks from the from the Democrats. Uh, their, their hold on power was was really quite tenuous. Mm -hmm. It's a good reminder too about Almost, if you kind of look at the Freedmen's Bureau, almost like the, these kind of pockets of these mil as military units, um, and you think about effectiveness, right. um, and as you're rotating officers in and out, I, I, I saw the same patterns when I was studying this in, in Texas history. You know, they, when you have these officers rotating in and out, any kind of relationships they build, for better or for worse, with whichever side they're aligning themselves with, is just so incredibly tenuous, so that when the next officer comes in, that side is gonna be less likely to work well with the next individual, assuming that that individual is even highly motivated. Um, you know, it, it was, it's just this, almost this recipe for disaster, that the policy of, you know, how the Freedmen's Bureau officers were, were kind of put into place and rotated out. It also reminds me of a really good lesson in military occupation and, and why occupations often go so badly why we often lose the peace it, it because it, this is it's all often it, because it's such an indirect fight in many ways um and such an amorphous fight with with these kind of moving targets if you will that yeah, I'm, i don't know there, there's so much that could have been done better um but i don't know that i that i could have could point to what the solution was or that someone had it mm. Mm. yeah we're still trying to figure right. all that out as far as it's concerned about military occupation and stuff but that's a it's a whole different live stream series that we won't <laughs> we won't get into but uh steph i want to bring something up that i know you're going to enjoy bringing up which is oh, yeah. next next friday's big event it's going to be oh happening. gosh yes thank you we, for saying we, that. we we have uh the digital land yap conference i think i said that right right yeah, great, uh, great job. Your French great. is great. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm uh, and I'll be a part of it. I'll be on one of the panels. Mm -hmm. But Steph, you want to go over what that conference is going to be? And I will put some uh, links in the uh, chat while you're doing that. Thank you so much, John. Yes, I wanted to plug very quickly um, that next Friday, April the 16th, um, University of Southern Mississippi will host its very first conference um, about digital humanities called Digital Land Yap. Um, John is being as kind as to put in the comments the program and the registration form. Um, we're so excited because this is really a different conference and we really, really want um, the public who are interested to come because digital historians are going to be in a roundtable format. Um, where we're going to discuss a bunch of topics in the field at the moment and a bunch of digital projects. But it's going to be a lot of fun because it's not like a traditional conference where people are reading their papers. Um, it's actually a discussion amongst scholars, amongst the audience and the moderators. Um, so if you come, you have the opportunity to be involved, ask questions and even offer advice. Um, so please um, think about coming. Um, it's going to be a fantastic time. It starts at 9 a.m. Central and goes to about 4 p.m. Central. Um, you don't have to stay for the whole thing. You can pop in and out of the sessions that you're interested in. Um, but we would love to have you. And just so you know, students, K through 12, undergrad, graduate, whatever you want, um, it's $10 to register. And for scholars in the general public, it's 15, which if you've ever been to a conference before, that is on the cheap, right, Susan? <laughs> That's lunch. 
Yes, yeah. we wanted to make it very, very cheap, but also to bring in a little bit of money because that money lets us hire graduate students in the summer to do DH uh, research and training themselves that helps with their own work and helps to further the field. But yeah, if you're interested in mapping projects, if you're interested in transcription projects like, like the one we're doing here, there's also going to be a round table on uh, gaming and game theory. And, you know, John's going to be talking a lot about that and how you can use gaming to explore the humanities and also recruit people to the humanities that might not otherwise see it as a, as a field that really interests them. Um, there's going to be a session on the black digital humanities and looking at looking at projects that are kind of enhancing our understanding of the African-American experience. Um, so there's, there's a real host of projects and it's also good, you guys, in the sense that there's going to be computer scientists and geographers. You know, this, these aren't just historians, uh, English lit scholars and things like that. We're really kind of embracing the diversity of the field. So I hope everybody can join us. And one of my favorite parts of the conference is the very last session. Um, we're going to be highlighting graduate student work because they are the future of the field, as hokey as that sounds. Um, but it's really impressive what some of the graduate students in our program have been able to accomplish in the last two years. Um, so spotlighting them and the hard work that they have been doing in classes on their own and as graduate assistants. Um, it's going to be a really unique opportunity to see what the future of the field is about to look like. So seriously, whether you're in the humanities, um, if you're a scholar, if you're the public, it doesn't matter. Come and join us and you're really going to enjoy some of these engaging conversations. Oh, and Data Scribe too. Don't forget the, the luncheon presentation is about some kind of new approaches to kind of using this module with an Omega S to, to take historical documents and create structured data from it, which, you know, if you do DH, you know how important and time consuming that can be. Um, if you don't do DH though, all of these sessions are open to totally, you know, non-experts, experts alike. Yeah, I'll be there all day hanging out <laughs> and uh, I'll be on like at one o'clock, I think, or something like that, one o'clock central. Yeah. I believe. Yeah, I think so off the top of my head. Yeah. Yeah, so I believe all time. Right time. there, audience. So <laughs> go yeah. take a look. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk Twitch and all kinds of good stuff for me. Mm -hmm. uh, but thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for hanging out this evening and talking about such a very important topic uh, with these documents. And I know that, uh, you know, as documents are being transcribed and, and uh, coming to light, this is going to really shed a lot of light on the idea of freedom and citizenship. And I really, really appreciate your time. Uh, Susanna, any final thoughts or, or Max, Steph? Anyone. We can go around Robin. It's fine. <laughs> I just want to thank everybody for, you know, participating tonight. All y'all and Max, you know, for you making making time to come in and join us and offer kind of your your insights on this important time period. Because it's it's like you said, there's a lot of layers and a lot of chaos going on. And don't forget, we have two more weeks of Facebook Live events. So we've got one next week and one the week after that, and then we're done. So please come and join us and listen to us talk. <laughs> yeah, y'all, the last two episodes are totally focused on memory and basically how the documents reveal the things that memory has somehow forgotten or erased or however you want to look at it. Next week, we'll be looking at some of the things that are often left out of Civil War memory in Mississippi, including um, unionism and in particular USCTs and the USCT experience. Um, and so we're gonna be joined by two interpreters from uh, Natchez National Park Service. Um, they're gonna be helping us do that. If you guys have ever had um, the tour at Melrose with uh, Barney Scobie, who is famous for his tours in Natchez, he'll be joining us along with David Slay, chief, uh, chief interpreter there in Natchez. And then for the last session on, on April 22nd, we're going to be joined by my friend and fellow historian, Ann Sarah Rubin, looking at kind of memory and descent and what's really forgot, what's forgotten in terms of, of, of that descent that you see, not just in the Confederacy, but throughout, excuse me, not just in Mississippi, but throughout the Confederacy, in which she's really written a lot about. Awesome. I can't wait. Two more, two weeks, uh, two, two more, more weeks of, of, of this and, and talking about memory, which still impacts us today because we're still... Uh, fighting with the idea of the memory of the conflict and uh, all the way back to the secession crisis, all the way through reconstruction. So this is going to be a fantastic uh, series coming up here in the next two weeks. And uh, don't forget everyone that uh, next Wednesday, this will be uh, a podcast episode. So you can find it wherever you get your podcast, whether it's Spotify, iTunes, Amazon music. Uh, we, we release the audio of each one of these weeks 
onto uh, onto the podcast platform under the Tattoo Historian Show. Uh, you can find last week's. I just dropped that yesterday. So we can uh, we can look forward to having this on a podcast. You can listen to it while you drive around at historical sites or wherever you're going and, and enjoy those as well. But uh, thank you everyone for, for hanging out with me here on the panel tonight. I really appreciate all of you and uh, I appreciate your time. And uh, everyone watching, thank you so much, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube, remember that the links to the project and getting involved in the project are in the chat as well as the, uh, what, what do we call it again? Digital land app. I'll get it. I'll get it. I'm, I'm a Pennsylvanian. We'd just be like, oh, no. uh, I'm from that, Pennsylvania that, too. You can oh, I know. Oh, I know. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You got two Pennsylvanians in here. Uh, that, is, that is also in the chat as well you know, on Facebook and YouTube. You can get, you can see the schedule and then uh, the link for actually signing up for it next Friday. Don't forget next Friday. We're going to plug it again next Thursday. And we're going to get you on that list. So thank you so much, everyone, for a wonderful evening. We will see you next week at the same time right here on the Tattoo Historians Facebook and YouTube channels. Be safe and have a wonderful evening. Thanks, all. Thank you. Bye.